Good afternoon, and welcome to the first episode of Expanding the Narrative, produced by Early Music Access Project. I'm Artistic Director David McCormick. This afternoon, we'll meet three extraordinary singers, baritone James Dargan and countertenors Patrick Daly and Reggie Mobley, all well-versed in historical performance practice. Together, we'll be exploring the idea that slave songs and spirituals are early music, and we'll be thinking about the ways we can apply our historical performance practice knowledge to these genres. I'll be connecting the Black sacred music traditions we talk about back to Early Music Access Project's home community of Charlottesville. Enslaved Monticello worker Peter Fawcett founded dozens of churches in Ohio upon gaining his freedom. We don't know much about Black sacred music at Monticello or in these Ohio churches, though we do know Fawcett considered the organ an instrument of the devil. We also know that th the tradition of lining out hymns was quite popular in Black churches in this region. Lucky for us, baritone James Dargan is a fount of knowledge on the lining out tradition. His interview is up first in just a few moments. Many of you have heard my lectures and performances illuminating the lives of the Scott family fiddlers, beloved by Thomas Jefferson and active well into the 19th century. Their mixed race status afforded them some advantages in society, but also caused them to face great hardship. Robert Scott Jr., from the third generation of these fiddlers, was a teacher at the Jefferson School, a building that now houses the African American Heritage Center in Charlottesville. Philena Karkin, a white teacher who helped found that school, gives us interesting accounts of the Scott family and also alludes to a group of Jefferson School students and teachers who were among the first class of Fisk Jubilee singers that toured Europe and made the spiritual famous. Later in the program, we'll chat with Patrick Daly, an expert on musical life at historically black colleges and universities, of which Fisk University is a prime example. I'll be speaking with Reggie Mobley about the current state of the early music field and the many ways we're addressing issues of equity and diversity. As the name of this series suggests, part of our mission is expanding the narrative to include the stories and songs of black musicians in America. We'll also join together at the end of this episode for a roundtable discussion on applying historical performance practice ideas to the study of slave songs and spirituals. Our panelists are with me live in the comments section of Facebook and YouTube for the premiere of this video on the afternoon of November 22nd. If you're joining us then, we encourage you to ask questions and offer comments throughout the broadcast. We look forward to responding in real time. James Dargan, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Hi, thank you so much. I feel welcome. Um, I want to introduce you briefly to our EMAP audience. Uh, you are a multi-talent, a baritone, a composer, a violinist. Yes, don't be shy. <laughs> yeah. um, I want to steal a line from your bio, which is brilliant, which is that you studied in new and old England. I love that, um, including Boston University. Um, you've taken Boston by storm, now you're taking New York and New Jersey by storm. Um, and you're here today to talk about the lining out tradition uh, in the Black church. In my research, it's become clear that um, the lining out tradition was probably pretty strong in these churches. We don't have a lot of concrete e evidence in that regard, but we have at least some anecdotal evidence. And I, um, I just, I want you to tell our audience about what lining out is, what it sounds like, and, um, and your personal experience um, with this tradition. Yeah, yeah. I love, I love that faucet line about kind of the devil's music or the devil's sound. It's so ironic for me because what we know of the musical and religious traditions of enslaved Africans, um, not only after emancipation, but before, is that they did do lining out and the crazy thing is lining out sort of sounds like the organ <laughs> when it when it so I, i'm always really amused when i when i think of that faucet quote because i'm like you know this this like slightly droning series of chords that all that seems to you know arise out of thin air and you know continue and then end when you do know not whence right you know not whence it comes or whatever and i'm like dude that's what we sound like when we do lining out. Like you have, 
you have this leader that will say something like, you know, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. Lay down your head, lay down your head, your weary head upon my breast. And then you get like maybe a three or four voiced chord, usually in a minor key. And the congregation just goes, you know, I heard. time check, you know, you hold the note forever, you know, the voice of Jesus. And I'm like, this is, this is as close to an organ as we got. So maybe, maybe he was tired of lining out too, but, <laughs> <laughs> but at any rate, it's just, it's such a, it's such a visceral form. And it's such a joy to talk about it precisely because besides comparing it to things like the the uh, traditional you know church organ um or you know forms of dance that are call and response there's nothing else um certainly not in um kind of colonial or or western european influenced culture um but also uh there's nothing else like lining out now even in most black churches, right? Because it is a, even when I was a kid and I'm, you know, the ancient age of 36, but um, when even I was a kid in the 80s and early 90s, it was on its way out, right? Like lining out as a tradition, as, 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 as a living tradition um, was being done in a lot of these kind of one room schoolhouse building type churches. Um, in the Deep South, where my, uh, where both of my parents are actually from. And the only reason I heard it, even in the Deep South, because it wasn't prevalent really there anymore, was because my parents actually met working on uh, the history of the Fisk Jubilee Singers and the lining out tradition. And so they met doing post-grad work and, you know, obviously hit it off, I guess a little bit because they had kids, but, um, <laughs> and so they were working on this book on lining out. And so because of that, I got to enjoy the fruits of their labor because a lot of the work they were doing when I was a kid was song catcher type stuff where they would just go around to all of these churches and pull out like the eight track machine with the tiny little microphone and just sit there in the corner and, like record the whole service, right? We had hours of these services on those eight track cassettes in our house. It's a visceral thing. I think the thing about it that that is different from say the church organ is that it's human voices. So if you're in the room, you start vibrating in sympathy. Mm -hmm. And like, even if you're not, even if you are not a singer, even if you're not inclined to sing in that moment, it's hard not to moan or hum with it because it just, it just moves through you, right? Um, you become, in a room where lining out is taking place, everyone in there at some point becomes part of this super highway of sound, right? So it's always been one of those things that I just kind of kept tucked away in my ear and my heart because there was no, it wasn't happening around me um, in general. But one thing I think I can compare it to besides the organ is um, whatever of your viewers or listeners have experienced even peripherally square dancing or step dancing or any kind of group dance form where, where there is a caller or a leader to tell you which step and which tune to go to for the band, you can sample the kind of physical involvement that is on every level of an African diasporic art. So, with lining out, even though it is, you know, supposedly a vocal or a musical form, it has its roots in the body. So the, the role of the caller, whether it is lining out or square dancing or step dancing, is to read the room because you cannot be a dance or lining out dictator, right? In those forms, your level of accomplishment, your level of, of skill as a caller is largely evaluated by how little people feel like they're being told what to do. And so it's, it's a fascinating, it's, it's a soft art, right? Like you, you have to read the room, you have to read the mood of the room, you have to know when to introduce a certain style or a certain song or a certain lyric. Um, and you have to know how to transition from what has gone before to where you want to go next in a way that again doesn't feel like you're saying and 
now we're switching. It is a call and response form that does not adhere to call and response form. It yeah, this, this was something that really kind of surprised me because mm -hmm. um, I read some, like, some descriptions yeah. early on mm -hmm. that said call and response. And I thought, okay, so somebody sings a thing, the congregation sings it back, cool. Yeah. Um, and, then I, um, and then I listened to a Sweet Honey on the Rock mm -hmm. and, and heard like, that it was a little messier than that. And then I listened to a, a recording, mm -hmm. like a, a field recording, I guess you would call it. Yeah. Um, and I was like, oh, yes. oh, this is what this is. Yeah. It's, it's, um, it's messy, but I don't mean that in a, in a negative way. Yeah, it, no. it is the most, it's, uh, it, it's visceral. That word yeah. that, you, that you've used uh, a few times is, yeah. is the best way to describe it. Yeah. And it does, even the recording affected my entire body. Well, that's the thing, like, even as we're talking about it, I'm remembering some of the first, um, some of the lining out, that is, that is my favorite examples of, of, of the form. And I'm getting the little goose pimples, right? Like, yeah. cause there's a, there's a, it's, it's that organ sound as well. It's that, it's that kind of ah, heard that every congregation and it, you know, we went from the Piedmont area, we went from South Carolina to Georgia, to Alabama, to Mississippi, to like, we were, we went all over the deep South and Yet the stylistic markers that held true were the ones that were the most thrilling for me. That that characteristic, grainy uh, vocal texture that at the same time was extremely clear and and on pitch, so that you could discern the harmonies that were being kind of grown out of the ground, right? And it's out of it's not out of you know. I know that again, you were in God's country, but I'm up here in New Jersey, and so they don't know what Southern dirt is like with that rich, mineral rich dirt, yes. where everything you hear in lining out, that, that's, that's, why, that's why a word like messy or dirty works, because it is dirty and visceral and messy in the best sense, right? Yeah. It doesn't, you know, the, the, the call and response, I love to see that break down when it's done well, because you might get like 10 seconds of a really clean call and response, but it's coming and going, right? Mm -hmm. like, the leader will switch back and forth between singing and chanting. Mm -hmm. Because if, you, if you're a leader and you're good, you can't turn it into your own concert. So you can't just be like, well, I'm going to sing everything now. Sometimes you have to bring it back down to, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and rest. You can't be, you know, the star, right? Because no one gets to be the star. And this is what I love the most about the form. Well, we are going to, in, in some ways, continue this discussion in the round table and, yes. and thinking about yeah. um, all of this in the context of, mm -hmm. of early music um, mm -hmm. very shortly. But I, I wanted you to just take a moment to introduce uh, the solo that you're going to sing for us. Yeah, so I picked an unaccompanied spiritual and uh, I'm gonna sing it in the old style. There's a, a very kind of melismatic, um, word painting and decoration rich solo way of doing spirituals which is the old style mm -hmm. um this i also learned in my childhood you know while i was in between being dragged around to lining out churches you know and i'm gonna sing a spiritual called over my head precisely because the chorus you know the, the the verses are repetitive but they switch out you know one or two words depending on you know just the 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 parallel structure of the of the text but the chorus says there must be a god somewhere and the older i get the less overtly religious i get but the more spiritual and woo woo i get because i mean look at all of everything um yeah. <laughs> and you know you got to cling to something um and you know some days i think my religion is bach sometimes my religion is music in general sometimes my music, my religion is spirituals but that idea that there is if not an anthropomorphized god um out there but that there is a force something that wishes the best for us and that moves on our behalf even when we don't know it that for me, knowing that spirituals mentioning God and Jesus and Mary were not these enslaved Africans all of a sudden being fans of Jesus, Mary, Yahweh, God, whatever. 
that they were using these names and these figures as symbols of their hope for freedom, their knowledge that there was something better, even as even a person who had been born on a plantation, right? If they knew somehow, even having seen nothing else outside of that life, if they could sing with certainty, there must be a God somewhere. I feel like I have to, what, you know, how can I do any less? Um, yeah. So that's, that's why I picked it. And I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to sing that for you guys. It's, I love it. Thank you so much. Um, well, we'll, we'll be talking again very shortly, yeah. but um, thank you so much um, for spending this time with me. Thank you, David. Good to talk to you. <laughs> oh, my head, I see beauty in the Patrick Daly, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Most certainly, it's a pleasure. Excellent. I, um, I want to introduce you to our Early Music Access pro uh, Project audience. Um, you are a fabulous countertenor. Uh, you've performed all over the world. You are a graduate of Morgan State University and Boston University. 
and you're currently teaching at Tennessee State University on the voice faculty there. I'm excited to, today to talk to you about uh, historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. Um, and the, the reason that this topic uh, has become important to me is that it now relates to some research that I've been doing in Charlottesville that I've um, told you a lot about. And I'm gonna just quickly uh, get my audience up to speed. Um, so, uh, I've been studying this wonderful family of fiddlers, uh, the Scots, who were favorites of Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. and Robert Scott Jr. of that family uh, taught at the Jefferson School, which was, I believe, the first black school in Charlottesville. Um, and there's a wonderful memoir from Philena Karkin, who was a white school teacher there. Um, and she uh, outlines that uh, some members of her classes ended up at Fisk University and were part of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And uh, Fisk is an HBCU. Um, and this really got uh, the juices flowing for me, wanting to know more about the musical culture at these universities, um, both historically and in the present. Um, and, and you are, are something of an expert being um, a graduate of Morgan State and a professor at um, uh, Tennessee State. I want to make sure I got that right. <laughs> um, and so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about um, musical life at these schools. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, for one, yes. Um, the arts and culture and music and just the overall experience of HBCUs is something that I'm very passionate about. The importance of those schools is something I'm passionate about, so I'm grateful to speak about it and to speak specifically about that music that we do, right? The Fish Jubilee Singers were initially an ensemble that was uh, started by the music, Latin, and uh, English teacher at Fisk, at the Fisk School, George White, uh, a white man from New York. He came down to Nashville, was a part of this school, and you know, put, and was teaching music to a number of the students. One of those students being a young lady named Ella Shepard Moore. Uh, well, Ella Shepard at the time, she became Moore in her, uh, when she married. Ella Shepard, um, yes, had been enslaved herself. However, there's a great, great really beautiful, powerful story uh, about how her mother, when she was born, was initially going to take her and herself and drown her because her mother did not want to have her and her children uh, in, it live in slavery. Mm -hmm. And out of nowhere, an old slave woman says, no, you must keep that child alive because that child is going to sing before kings and queens. That mm -hmm. child is going to make a mark on the world. That's important because initially when this group is started, and she also has come in, by the time Ella Shepard comes to the fifth school, she's already had piano lessons. She's already actually been trained. What was happening when she comes in to the school, George White says, oh, let's put this choir together to raise some money. Because by the time they're all in the, at the fifth school together, the, uh, you know, they're trying to raise money as everybody's trying to do all the time. But particularly that's also, it has always been a thing with HBCUs. Puts together a choir and initially this group of singers and he has the inspiration from the Bible of, oh, this is the year of Jubilee and that's the name. Puts together these singers, they're going out and they're singing the standard repertoire, if you will. Mozart, Palestrina, Bach, all of that. No one's finding any interest. There's no interest in it at all. It's not like they may have made two, two or three dollars at a concert when they're doing it initially, nothing. Then you go to, um, but then he, as the story goes, uh, there's a group of singers, the students are singing among themselves, spirituals in a basement, just to themselves. He comes down into the basement and he overhears them. And he says, oh my goodness, we need to sing those songs. We should put them in this configuration, sing them like this, and we, and like, you know, SATB choral style, we should sing them. And they were initially resistant. Hmm. Students said, no, we don't want to, this is for us. We, you know, we sing these for our own, uh, you know, memories, but this is not necessary. We, this, it's, there's, there's some shame, there's some, there's some fight, there's just so many things. And they said, no, we, we're resistant. However, he's able to convince them over time. And it is Ella Shepard who works with him to compile the songs and to arrange the songs. 
where it also comes back into key about her singing before kings and queens, October 6, 1871, the Jubilee singers are um, singing before Queen Victoria. And she, there's so many, there's a lot of accounts about how she remarked about, yes, their sound, but how they looked, how they presented. You know, some were darker, some were lighter. And she kind of pulls one out and says, no, you, ooh, that skin is like, it's like the ebony tree. And, and I need to touch that. Oh my goodness. And you were just really light. Now where it ties in, of course, to Hampton and to other schools and where we get into where we are now. Um, Hampton, the Hampton Institute founded 1868. They see what the, what's happening. And they say, well, we're going to start a group. And then other <laughs> colleges start saying they're going to start groups, right? So everyone begins to start these ensembles. And so this can be a choir, a choral group. It could be even a gospel choir. It, at Howard University, there's also Afro Blue, a major jazz ensemble. Uh, and then, of course, our noted marching bands. And there's just a style and a way that our marching bands perform that are, that's unlike any other. So we have such a, and, and again, there's been a great uh, tradition of, 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 of classical music. So particularly even, even down in, in, in New Orleans at Xavier University, um, they have a rich tradition historically of opera. So they were doing full scale productions of operas and such. Wow. And then we see the implementation of an integration as a, as a directly of jazz and gospel into programs into music department programs, but also as uh, social uh, organizations on the campuses. So our, our campuses are just alive with music, but it runs so deeply um, back in many ways to that impetus of the Jubilee Singers. Excellent. Um, it's, we, we owe a great debt to these HBCUs um, for uh, really bringing musical culture alive, uh, for, for elevating the spiritual. Um, yes. Something you know to a, to a genre that is now um, well known throughout the world, um, and um, and I'm excited that we're going to hear you sing one of these um, remarkable spirituals. Can you uh, tell us about what you're going to perform? Yes, uh, so I will be singing uh, an arrangement of it's called Little Boy, as arranged by Roland Hayes. Now, Roland Hayes, many would know him as uh, the great tenor, who was also a composer, but Roland Hayes was, um, was from Calhoun, Georgia, and was a Fisk Jubilee singer. So there were a number of years that Fisk, uh, the Jubilee singers actually were not a SAT choral ensemble, but the, the, the more in style, in fashion ensembles were the quartet, the male quartets. And Roland Hayes was the first tenor in the Fisk Jubilee male quartets. There are actually a number of recordings that you can find of him as a student uh, in these ensembles. And so he goes on to have this immense career um, singing German leader and being a concert artist all over the world, but he never forgot his roots. Mm. And so this arrangement of Little Boy uh, is, it's really cool, it's a narrative spiritual, what we call a narrative Negro spiritual. So it tells the story of Christ at, uh, uh, as a little boy, the little boy in the temple, when he uh, is preaching and he's doing all of these things and they're like, who are you coming up here saying all of this? And so they keep asking, little boy, how old are you? Little boy, how old, little boy, how old are you? And Jesus says, sir, I'm only 12 years old. And it tells different points, okay, when he was born and, you know, and even into a point of when he, uh, when he pat when he dies and he ascends, and but again tying back to that little boy being twelve years old preaching in the temple, wow. uh, and so it's a it's really cool. That's a one of my favorite ones, and it will be uh, performed by myself and my uh, a fellow co-founder of Early Music City, Francis Perry, uh, on lute. I can't wait to hear it. Um, well, thank you so much. We're going to um, hear from you a little more later in this episode, uh, but I really appreciate you taking the time to speak with me today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, David. Absolutely.
Welcome, Reggie Mudley. Thanks. Thanks, David. Thank you for being here to, uh, to talk with me today. I want to introduce you really quickly to our Early Music Access Project audience. Um, you are a phenomenal countertenor, uh, acclaimed all over the world for your wonderful voice, and I'm so glad that you're adding your voice to the discussion we're having today. Um, we're going to talk about equity and inclusion in the early music field today. And um, I can think of no one better to, to speak about this than you. I would love to just kind of give you the floor. Maybe first you could just tell us about your role in, in Handel and Haydn Society and, um, and how that's going. Of course, thanks, David. Uh, it's going surprisingly well. Um, as well as to be expected. Everything, every every positive affirmation, affirmation has an asterisk after it uh, these days. Uh, but it mostly, it started maybe five years ago during the bicentennial celebration of Hanlon Hyden Society uh, in 2015. 2015 was also the sesquicentennial celebration of the end of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. um, so two years before, in 2013, uh, actually 2012 and leading into 2013, H&H &H started ramping up their research to get ready for their bicentennial celebration. At the same time, the Museum of African American History in Boston, they were doing research and, and looking at past records, to, to, uh, ramping up for the 150th anniversary, centennial anniversary of, of the Emancipation Proclamation, and then also for the 14th Amendment and the end of the Civil War. During that time, they both had this, this moment where it was this Reese's moment of, hey, that's your chocolate and my peanut butter, where H&H &H saw these, 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 they found these records of, of, of rally and of concerts and of all this abolitionist work, and the museum found, kind of found the same records um, in their research, that H and H at the time, the 1850s and 60s, was basically a den of abolitionists, a coven of abolitionists, even, and they were they were all all kind of fighting, are are arguing, are working towards ending slavery. Uh, there were some that were actually part of the group that helped to convince President Lincoln that repatriation would have been a disaster, but emancipation would have been um, just better in every in every regard um and as a matter of fact one of those you know one of those members of h, &H at the time uh was julia ward howe who wrote the battle hymn of the republic uh oh, her and her husband both sang yeah they both sang in in the h, &H course at the time well so they because they found this h, &H reached out to the museum as the museum was actually reaching out planning to reach out to them and they said why don't we partner up and do something in 2013 to celebrate the Emancipation Proclamation, and we would recreate the concert that H and H performed um, the night before the ratification. You know, basically they performed basically leading up that whole night into the ratification of the Emancipation Proclamation, and and so that happened in 2013. Uh, they repeated it in 2014, and then when they were getting ready for 2015. They wanted to do more, um, the museum wanted to do more, and H&H &H wanted to do more as well. And, and they, so they offered to H&H, &H, why don't you come and present a concert of Black American composers, the choral music of Black American composers? They said, great. And what they did is they looked and said, oh, wait, we don't have a single person of color. In the, in the ensemble, um, so they 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 kind of reached out. Uh, I'd sung with H H a few times since I moved to Boston um, in the chorus, and had long since left. And they asked if I'd be willing to curate a concert of Black American composers, or choral composers, and I said, "I've never conducted before, um, so absolutely yes, I will I will try this." And so and so I did, and. We put a concert together. It went really, really well. Um, in in May of 2015, bicentennial year, and that was um, really well attended. It was great. We got a nice little write up, and it was maybe a little later that um, we found out through Amelia uh, Maria Lynn Bernard, who was the president of H, &H at the time, um, that I was the first black person to ever lead H and H. 
um, in its 200 year history on, you know, during its 200th year uh, celebration, its bicentennial celebration. Um, they, but it was such a, um, such fun for me and they enjoyed it so much that they offered uh, me a chance to do it again. And so I did, I returned next year to, uh, to the museum. And it, that same year, we got an offer from uh, the uh, First Church in Roxbury, which is a historical church. Um, it's the oldest wood frame church in Boston, in Roxbury, which is a historical black neighborhood, where you know Martin Luther King Jr. lived and Malcolm X lived, and and so much happened in in that neighborhood. And they wanted me to just find a concert that we could do uh, in November, Sunday, November fifth basically the Sunday before voting day of 2016. Uh, so there was quite a bit of pressure on me to do so. And so I created this concert uh, called Requiem for Division, where we kind of created a kind of a non-denominational sort of just like funeral service, musical funeral service that symbolically put away difference. It basically was a funeral for division. Wow. And so we did that. It was, it went pretty well. Uh, the election didn't, uh, and but every year they said we want you to come back and do something else, and that's when I created my Every Voice series that I've been running um, every November since then, and through that I would I would focus on various aspects of the Boston community. I was a psychology major for a few semesters, and I fell in love with you know Gestalt theorem, Gestalt therapy with uh, Fritz and Laura Perros. And the idea that the whole is greater than the sum of parts. And I kind of adapted that where I asked the question, I know that we you know it's the Gasol theory insists that the whole is greater than the sum of parts, but I would like to suggest that maybe the whole is better served if we understood and really respected what what the individual parts brought to the table. And that's my what in my and that's my idea for community. And so with that, I would focus, we would focus in these concerts on various communities and sub-communities in Boston, the black community, the queer community, Latinx, uh, Jewish community, and so forth, and break them up into small vignettes and do three, three different communities in every concert. And with that, I would do a lot of research and find as many composers <clears throat> of these various groups um, as early as I can find. And as and as modern I can find, and put them together in these little these little community cantatas, basically. Oh my gosh! Uh, <laughs> and so with that, I sort of introducing to H and H audiences all of these diverse composers. I mean, not just Isabel Leonardo and Cozzolani, but Ignacio Sancho, you know, Xavier San George, um, Nunez Garcia, um, you know, Esteban Salas, like all of these composers that had never really been considered by by you know by by h and h and you know a lot of historical performance ensembles anyway um you know but i also included bob mcferrin and zanita robles and you know and wow. it was a huge mix of of people that represented and showcased the not only the brilliance and beauty of of diverse musicians of various of you know sexualities and genders and 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 colors but also that all of us have existed for so long in what in in classical music or in the music sphere, that yeah. that we haven't we aren't just newcomers or outsiders, you know, as we've been led and taught to believe, but the fact that we have always been a part of it, and so that led a few years later to me being called in to the H and H office. They wanted to expand my role and they wanted to create this new position for me, which we decided we fell on the name of. Uh, programming consultant for H and H. H and H saw that it was time to actually, you know, put our money where our mouth is, and really start doing the work. And if and so they wanted to bring me in officially to bring the work I've been doing with Every Voice to the subscription series, the main stage H and H. So really, kind of start diversifying what we offer instead of cycling the same few composers over and over and over as so many historical performance groups are just classical groups do, it's time to showcase the fact that the the world of music 
is more diverse, it is more colorful, it is more varied than what we've led everyone and ourselves to believe. So effective this summer, I am now officially um, and actively the programming consultant for Hammond Hyde Society in Boston. That is wonderful, and congratulations on that. And um, it's it's really it's so wonderful, and it's I think this um, this idea of uh, highlighting the black historical lives is so important in our field in terms of getting current black lives <laughs> involved in our field because um, it changes the um, the relevance of what we're doing. And I think that's so great. Um, I've I've been just so interested in my own research, uh, learning about uh, black musicians that are in these sort of European American spaces, uh, in these white spaces and really making an extraordinary impact. Um, you know, I'm thinking of these fiddlers in the Scott and Hemings family that were playing um, for these balls, these very posh balls attended by white plantation owners essentially. Um, uh, and they were playing the most popular European opera dances of the day and European folk music, frankly. It, it doesn't fit with our, our notion of black music, right? Of um, here are spirituals and slave songs and this becomes ragtime and jazz and hip hop. Um, it has nothing to do with that trajectory, but it's so important and, um, and uh, just so valuable to realize that um, there are so many black musicians and just black individuals period that made an enormous impact um, historically. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I agree with that completely. I would love if you would introduce for us uh, the piece that you're going to perform for us, which I'm, I'm so excited to, to hear. Um, I was born and raised in the church. I'm a boy of the South, as so many of us are, the good ones are at least. <laughs> and... <laughs> Um, but <laughs> one spiritual that was always sung in, you know, that I just it didn't know much about it, but it was just something that we always sang whenever things were, were just going poorly, you know, personally are within the community or within the neighborhood. But um, Balm and Gilead is a strong spiritual that has always been a part of my life. has always been a balm for me. And I think in this time uh, with, with, Ter you know, this terrible pandemic and this horrible division and political situation and, you know, the lack of safety for people of color and, and trans people as, as well, you know, this spiritual, it does its job because it's beautiful and it really is a salve for the soul. So that's why I want to sing uh, for y'all is a balm and Gilead. Yeah, we could all use a balm right now. <laughs> well, Reggie, um, thank you so much. And I look forward to um, speaking to you again uh, shortly in our roundtable discussion. Awesome. Yep. See you soon. Thanks. There is a balm in Gilead to make the To heal the 
sin sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, oh, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus and say he died for To make the wounded whole, there is a balm in Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. I have with me all three of these all-star early music singers now for a wonderful roundtable discussion. Um, and I want to give some credit, credit to Reggie because it is, it is something that Reggie wrote on Facebook that got the juices flowing for the, for the idea for this roundtable discussion, which is that slave songs and spirituals are early music and that um, we have this responsibility to use our early music brains, our historical performance practice brains, as we think about, um, about these genres. Um, and so I really, I wanna kind of open up the floor to the three of you to talk about this. Um, but I wanna start by, again, bringing this back to Charlottesville. You'll have to forgive me. I'm, I'm a Charlottesville boy and uh, that's, that's where all this started for me. Um, and this description by Felina Karkin of the Fisk Jubilee Singers. So this is a white school teacher in Charlottesville who was teaching free black children um, and helped to found the first uh, black school in Charlottesville. Um, she describes the, um, the smoothing down of the spiritual um, by the Fisk Jubilee Singers. And, um, and that has me thinking a little bit about the ways in which the spiritual, as we perform it now, has changed over time. I'm also thinking of the sort of the operatization of the spiritual, um, you know, the opera singer providing the, the concert arrangement that is incredibly virtuosic. Um, and so I would love uh, whoever wants to jump in first. <laughs> um, James, I bet you want to jump in first. <laughs> I mean, it's on one hand, Hearing about that smoothing down, you know, <laughs> automatically uh, encourages the opposite reaction from my hackles. They just go up, right? Mm -hmm. um, it, it's... And the sad thing about it is, I understand why one would say that, having heard the Fisk Jubilee Singers. But we know that the Fisk Jubilee Singers and Harry Burley and all of the, the composers that, that worked with him deliberately smoothed down the spirituals that they presented to the white audiences because they hoped to gain entree into those white musical circles by virtue of that smoothing down because they knew that the full panoply and the full vibrant and visceral quality not to say visceral precludes smooth but they knew that the full variety of spiritual singing as it is practiced by black people would scare the living daylights out of a colonizer trying to understand it. And so it, it, it also, that, that smoothing down quality of the, that comment, while it kind of gives me a little bit of a feeling of chagrin, also I understand what our singing ancestors were trying to do and why Karkin heard it as such. And then that smoothing down takes me to thinking about the operatic kind of style of singing spirituals and makes me realize that again, our forebears and some of our colleagues, right? Our, our operatic, uh, operatically inclined colleagues, and even I, right? We will smooth down what we do in a spiritual for the sake of staying with the pianist, 
staying with the choir that's backing us, um, fitting into the bounds of how we are being presented. But I think that while that comment immediately makes me bristle, it's actually fun to unpack because it means something in terms of how we, as mainstream musicians, hear. And I think that's when I want to kind of throw it to my illustrious colleagues because it's about how your ear functions. If you hear a certain kind of harmony and vocal timbre as smoothing down, what is unsmooth? What is your bass line for smooth, rough, appropriate, inappropriate? And because I have no authority on what is appropriate, not like Patrick and Reggie, I'm gonna throw it to them because those gentlemen are much more mannered than I am, well mannered than I am. <laughs> If I may, um, I think I want to expand on that. Um, not only because when we bring about the Jubilee Singers, uh, we think about Burley, we think about anybody else that has come after and within that time, time uh, frame and even now. What you have to recognize is what is happening for formerly enslaved people at that time. So the singing and the art is a reflection of what they're literally being told, essentially. Mm -hmm. Fisk is named for General Clinton B. Fisk. Howard is named for General Howard. Mm -hmm. Morgan is named for Reverend Morgan, right? These are, Morehouse is named for, these are, and these are not black people. Mm -hmm. These institutions are named for white people. Mm -hmm. So much like our brothers and sisters of indigenous heritage, these institutions created, many of them by the Freedmen's Bureau, many of them by, you know, well-meaning whites, if you will. And even Hampton itself, right? Um, these institutions are in, in some way, and I think I've said it before, working to civilize the Negro. And so, because what you also have to recognize too, that these formerly enslaved people and really black people around the world under the systems that we're in really don't have much of a control, have not had much of a, have a real say in how we move and comport. And so it's always us trying to navigate based upon the system that's already put in front. So this smoothing down idea is a direct reflection of the, of, of like, okay, here is how you move. And so then we internalize that or they internalize that and say, okay, this is how we move. So the smoothing down in the sound and in the singing is a direct correlation to what is being basically imposed upon them with the intention, and though it may be a well-intended thought, that this is how you will survive if you move yourself closer into the Eurocentric white idiom even in your singing, even in your presentation. It is, as I've told the story, George White who says to the singers, we should sing these, but we'll do them like this. It is Dvorak saying, who is not black, saying to Burley, you should preserve these songs, but how is, but, but again, his framing of how it's preserved already comes from a Eurocentric standpoint. So it makes sense that he would say, well, let's do it SATB. Let's do it piano, vocal. Let's do, let's do it like this. And let's do it written down, scored, as opposed to the oral tradition, let's, as opposed to not having, as opposed to the, 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 the field hollers that we automatically have. And I even have theories that when I, in my own teaching about how, you know, what we do within traditional um, rural and even urban black spaces sort of sets us up differently to sing um, in the bel canto. We already have an idea of squilo. We already have an idea of resonance. We already have an idea of support. We already have an idea of an open backspace. We already have that because we've been singing like that forever. Mm -hmm. if, you hear the, if you hear Church Mother singing a line hymn and she raises up in a place that's really tiny, but you can hear her across the field, mm -hmm. Mother's already got, she's already got what that thing is that you went to study Marchese to figure out. Reggie, I, I, I want to throw a question to you that I've been thinking a lot about, and that is whether um, we can use our historical performance brains 
or whether we even should use our historical performance brains to try to recreate the, the non smoothed out sound um, for audiences. I think we should. I think it's, I think the, the idea of historical performance is authenticity. And if we are scholars, black scholars, white scholars, just scholars in general, we make no, there's, there's no, we cast no aspersions. We don't have any issue with digging up and making sure that we can pronounce, you know, 13th century French as accurately as possible. We have no issue arguing for hours on end about German Latin versus French Latin versus Spanish Latin when we just, you know, we just need to sing Latin, then why, why, why should we use any less, you know, of a mind about authenticity towards spirituals? Like that's what we love to do. And we have, and luckily we have a long line of oral traditions that still tie back to the way things were. Um, I think in, in, to kind of tie that question into what was already being mentioned, um, about, you know, smoothing down the spiritual. Um, there were two things. When I was in high school, I was obsessed with Carmen and Miranda. <laughs> Weird. Who wasn't? Yes, I know. Weird kid. Anyway, I read her, I read her biography. And in her biography, they talked about how when she left Brazil, she never was able to come back and perform the way she did because she spent so much time smoothing down sambas and, and like various styles that she knew growing up with to fit in, you know, fit in with white audiences, especially in Hollywood and New York. Um, but on another hand, I also think of Bach and the way that his music is so transferable that it can, like, no matter how you feel about Bach, it can fit in any way with, with, with Monte Verdi Choir or with Boston Symphony or with Jacques Lussier and Swingle Singers or with Sting and Mary J. Blige, Bach always fits in every corner. And the thing about those two, two separate things is that for us, for black people in our music, it's versatile. It can fit anywhere. I think there is a there is maybe an almost an inherent understanding that yes we we can let ourselves be smoothed down or we can smooth this music down you know we can create a low sodium version for white audiences but but we know we know within ourselves that when we're ready to throw when we're ready to sing we can still sing like it's always going to be um and i want to throw this to patrick actually because we had a wonderful conversation a few days ago um, talking about Bach and spirituals. And I would love if you would just say what you said to me the other day for, for our audience. I, it was brilliant. <laughs> if I can recall, because I mean, what, when, when Reggie brought up Bach, what made, what, one of the things I thought about, and I may have said it then and I can't remember, but you know, you have to look at the, the, the intent with the songs that were created. Bach oftentimes, when you're looking at Bach and even Telemann and composers of that era, you know, and, and what they're saying, it's always about, you know, oh, have mercy on me because I'm inherently bad. It's always like, I'm so dirty. It's actually, it's so funny. It's a little kind of, you know, almost what it would be more modern Pentecostal <laughs> and, and in some ways like, oh, Jesus is fixed because I'm just so dirty and bad because I don't sin, sin, sin. Like, it's that. However, when you look at the spiritual, it is, no, I'm worthy of being saved. I'm, I, I'm, I'm like, there's always this thought of, I am, I, I, I am your child, so I deserve it. It's not do it because I'm so unworthy. No, I'm worthy of it. You have to do it. There's so there, so, and I think that we have to balance that because again, what a Western spiritual philosophy will give us is you're inherently bad, so you have to work your way up. And really what African and indigenous spirituality will give us is you are, you, you are, you are the source, you are divine, you are this, we, you deserve all that, you, you deserve all the good. So when they create the songs and when they sing the songs about save me, Lord, save me, also there, you have to remember too, there is a full, uh, as a, uh, uh, Carter G. Woodson would more to so say the the uh, the the um, 
Lord, I'm listening, forgetting it, but like the, the duplicity, the dual nature of the of the Negro or of the slave song. But myself and Dr. Alicia Lola Jones, she would more so say the, uh, the you know, the multiple consciousness. There we go. The, the, the dual consciousness and the multiple consciousness. You can have one song that has multiple meanings. And I have had these experiences of being able to sing Bach, but I'm interpreting it through my Black experience. So if I sing the unused day, Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, I'm thinking about that because I've known you to be that. And also the sins of the world are not just, oh, cheating and lying. The sins of the world is the oppressive system and I've known you to bring me through it. This guy, he's just, he's, Patrick is just like throwing out so much beautiful, beautiful wisdom. It's, it's isometric. This idea that you're talking about, about how one kind of theology and one and 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 concomitantly with that, one kind of thinking about musical theology can push the other one. And it, it, isometric, obviously, is you know muscles working against each other to make each other stronger. Mm -hmm. Each both sides are benefited by this, but also even that even the song that you mentioned when you were talking about how Bach and the other composers of that time often uh, lean towards a style of utterance that wouldn't be out of place in the evangelical tradition with the fix me Jesus. But, you know, the spiritual fix me Jesus, where even that says, fix me for my journey home. Because as you said, it's not, I am a piece of dirt, I am worthless. It is, fix me for my journey home to paradise, or to freedom, or to all these multiple uh, uh, definitions. But but the idea that you that you spoke on so beautifully about how the the enslaved African already knows that they are a child of the divine, that the divinity is in them and of them, and so they just want to be helped on their journey over Jordan to that promised land that they're from already, mm -hmm. right? So, and the the other the other thing that you just like, it it was just it's beautiful. This idea that when you're singing Bach, you can have the, you know, not only the uh, double consciousness that, that comes with being a black person in a, in a colonial space, but also the double and multiple consciousnesses that just kind of run through our lineage. The way you think about Anya's Day is the way that, that Anya's Day is the way that I think about and feel when I sing Mahdish. Because it is not this, I don't feel that my heart is so dirty that it needs to be washed thoroughly wash me through through and through but i also feel like i am ready to be washed when i sing that so that it is not oh my god fix me because i am too dirty to be fixed it is fix me because i want to be better because i know that i am better than that so i just i love i just love the idea of that because context and subtext from the singer means that your audience gets more from the piece that you you yourself are saying a piece in a way that they don't think of it in that way and you were giving them your feedback on this piece that they've created but it is a new it is a new creation because you are singing it i want to give maybe reggie an opportunity to to say a few more words and then we'll probably wrap this up it's kind of funny when we we keep somehow bringing this back to bach which certainly isn't me that's doing this um and actually it is not for once uh <laughs> so that's on y'all but that's but but that's kind of my where 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 my points tend to go um when you think about the music of that time i mean bach was writing out of a out of another period of hurt you know at the there was a a much lesser pain than than what was going on in the americas with slavery but when Bach was writing, they were all coming out of the Thirty Years' War, which was pretty heavy. Like everyone was dealing with massive death, massive loss, massive pain and suffering. And people at time, especially in Germany or in that parts of in part of Europe, but what would be Germany, you know, they had no idea what tomorrow was going to bring. They had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, there was all this infant death, death of parents, you know, Bach lost both his parents before he was 10. You know, there, there was all of this, this unsettling nature of, of, okay, this doesn't really work here. The world is not, <laughs> is not great. And you can, you see that in Bach's writing, not just in the Anusay and Machadich, but, but also when you think of like, Ichabagnuk, it's like, I've had enough. This, this world has nothing for me. I am done with this. There is something better for me 
across there. And there and there has been that tie thematically between between a lot of music that, that we come up with and a lot of the music that Bach and Schutz and, and a lot of the composers coming out of 30 years war did write. But more than that, it's about it's about the spirit that exists in the music that I think that I'm picking up from especially from from James and Patrick and that Bach at the time and, and and a lot of and a lot of composers in Europe at the time obviously they weren't these god artists who who you know who wept at tea and wrote things and then just cried in the corner and died of consumption these were craftsmen these were practical musicians who <clears throat> who were a part of it like the spots on the page was just a template it was just a chart and but the most the music was us like the music was bach the music were his sons the music were the people who actually did the work that that was the spark of life that created something bigger than what it was and and in thinking about how we're kind of not really saying it but talking about it that spirit has been lost in westernized classical music and western european music it's become more and more formal, more and more polite, more and more sterile and whitewashed and straight washed and just bland, just completely plain. But the thing is, is that why why we have why we have that connection to Bach is because we've kept that spirit in black music because because just as you know uh, African slaves did and just as you know you know Europeans did after Thirty Years' War music became a part of who you were it became a basic need it's how you contextualized and really dealt with life at the time it was how we processed so much and for us we still do not just from slave songs and negro spirituals but also you know civil rights and rally songs and protest songs like even now you know from you know from the earliest slave song to to burley to to Kendrick Lamar, like it's it's that's what we are and who we are. It's a part of who we are, and there is a lesson to be learned in the classical sphere in serious music from us. That that spirit is still something that can be reclaimed. That we really need that that actually y'all need to learn that lesson and take from what we do. That that this spirit, this this willing to just put ourselves in something and be vulnerable and feel and tie into each other and just be one another is something that really makes music alive. And if classical music, early music, if that's going to continue, you're going to need to learn that lesson because not just because it may continue to become more sterile, but practically the world's getting a hell of a lot blacker <laughs> and the world's getting a hell of a lot more queer. Like, and so it's time to really start looking at what we are drawn to and what we're pulled to and learn the lesson and just, I don't know, be better. I love it. Thank you so much. Um, I, I am sort of sad to bring this to an end. Um, I have enjoyed speaking with all three of you individually together over the last weeks and months. Um, and thank you for sharing your knowledge with my audience and, um, and your talents. Um, thank you all so much. Thank you for joining us for this first episode of Expanding the Narrative. I've learned so much speaking with James, Patrick, and Reggie, and I hope you have too. There's exciting work to be done to understand spirituals and slave songs through the lens of historical performance. But more importantly, today's conversation has illuminated for me that there is much we can take from the theology and performance of spirituals as we perform the sacred works of Bach, Buxtehude, and the rest of the old dead white guys. Until next time, I'm David McCormick.